Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to this webinar, Future Proof Coding with IFML. I'm Michela Frigerio from WebRatio and I will be your host. I'm glad to introduce you the speakers for the today's section. Uh, Daniel Part is the software architect for digital, digital and mobile technologies at Cognizant. Marco Brambilla is professor of, of software engineering at Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy. He is the inventor and the designer of the IFML Interaction Flow Med Modeling Language. Just a quick note before I step aside, if you have any question or technical issues, please write in the chat box you have at the bottom right of your screen and your question will be taken up in the question and answer session that we will have at the end of this webinar. We are also recording this session and we will email the, you the link so you, that you can review the webinar later on. Once again, thank you for joining us and now uh, I give the word to Daniel and Marco. Thank you, Michela. That was great. Um, uh, thank you, uh, folks, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time and um, uh, we'll uh, uh, go over the fundamentals of IFML today. As you know, that this is a three-part series and uh, uh, thank you, Professor Marco, for uh, being on this panel, for helping uh, our audience understand the IFML. So, uh, as we start, uh, could you uh, share with us uh, a little bit of your idea how IFML was born and uh, how this whole uh, concept was uh, conceived in the beginning. Uh, I think our audience is interested to know that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Daniel, for bringing this up. Hello, everybody. Um, I think the story here is pretty simple. We started from a common problem that is the pain that everybody is uh, <laughs> expecting every time they start uh, developing uh, application, software applications that involve user interaction and user interfaces. We know that most of the effort goes into designing the system infrastructure, system architecture, and so on. But then when you go down to designing the way people interact with the systems, a lot of things remain to be done. And we realize that, we realize that the cost of this and the difficulties of having good uh, user interfaces and user experiences was uh, extremely high. Uh, so because of that, we started thinking about a new and innovative method for designing user interfaces that was not just manual coding by a bunch of people, experts in whatever UI technologies uh, they wanted to use. We started thinking more in abstraction, at abstraction level, and we designed a method that was involving modeling instead of uh, low low level programming. Uh, and this stories story started 10 years ago, went ahead with a lot of uh, industrial experiences actually, and then was uh, let's say completed with the last step that was the standardization of the approach. At the end, we went uh, three years ago. We went to the OMG, the Argent Management Group, that is a standardization body uh, based in the US but international where we, uh, just for you to know or to remember you may know that the OMG is the standardization body for UML and uh, BPMN for instance uh, and we went to them with this proposition of having a standard for describing user interfaces and user interaction in a way that people could improve productivity and communication. We ended up with IFML, the Interaction Flow Modeling Language. It took us three years to formalize the language and then finally uh, in 2014 uh, the language was uh, adopted as an international standard by the OMG. So this is pretty much the story. Thank you, uh, Professor Marco. That was excellent introduction. Uh, uh, 
what uh, were the exact uh, pain points? Uh, you said that uh, you were in discussion with uh, several uh, corporations and uh, users, and they were talking to you about uh, what are the difficulties they face in development. So uh, can you elaborate a few of those pain points uh, which uh, you are trying to address uh, when you were building this uh, framework? Sure. Well, as I said before, we were addressing a, a a very known, uh, very well known uh, issue in software development that is user interface modeling and design. And the main problems we realized was that user interface was one of the points where the communication problems between the business requirements and the IT implementations uh, uh, was big, larger. So there was a, a we perceived a huge gap between the business and the IT in this. Uh, sense. Uh, why? Why is that? I mean, we all know that this is one of the biggest challenges in modern uh, corporation and large organizations are suffering a lot of the, because of this. Uh, the business cannot uh, get the IT on board uh, quickly and effectively for uh, obtaining their, their objectives. Why is that? Well, basically for the three th reasons you see here. Be, uh, we, we need to realize that these two worlds speak completely different languages. People in the business have a completely different terminology, completely different objectives, and also completely different ways of measuring the quality of the results with respect to the IT. So things that are assumed as obvious from the business may not be uh, from the IT perspective and vice versa, and this leads to a, a big chasm, a big, a big uh, separation between these two worlds. Basically, what we try to achieve here is to reduce the communication problem between these two worlds by providing a common ground, some kind of common language that the two worlds can share for understanding each other in a more productive and effective way. Here, we are not talking about solving all the problems of the entire organization. As I said before, we are focusing on a specific issue that is covering the user interface design problem. By itself, it's a huge challenge already. Why, why, why is that? Well, first of all, uh, we all uh, assess that the user interfaces are getting more and more complex to, de to design and deploy. Why? Well, our customers are more and more demanding in terms of quality of the user interaction and the user experience. And to cope with that, we need to come up with continuously new and, improve and continuously improving uh, technologies for implementing our inter user interfaces. If you combine this with the fact that there are, we, we are really still lack good tools for designing user interfaces and user interaction, we end up with a lot of things that need to, designed, to be designed manually uh, with uh, people that are basically the tailors of the user interfaces that uh, need to be knowledgeable about all the tricks of you know, JavaScript programming, designing tricky uh, uh, combinations of user events for getting some effects that the user perceives as, as useful. And this is extremely difficult and costly. Uh, all of this comes together with the fact that you need to come to an agreement between the business that proposes an idea and requires some to cover some needs and the IT that, need, that actually needs to cover the needs. So all of this brings to a process that is extremely costly, extremely, extremely expensive and very frequently leads to, let's say, delusion of the expectations uh, from the business perspective because we respect to what you had in mind when you started the project, you frequently end up with a quality of the result that is not acceptable, simply not acceptable for, for uh, your end users. So these are the issues that we are trying to cover here with IFML.
Thank you, uh, Professor. That was great. Uh, I, I think uh, I can relate uh, to some of these pain points, and I'm sure uh, many in our audience uh, understand. In the flow of development, uh, the first thing we do is we get some UX designers, and then we try to look at the design from uh, the perspective of business, share it with the development team. So what uh, IFML uh, does here is it, it proposes a common universal language uh, approved by the OMG, where everybody understands certain symbols, and uh, once those symbols are laid out, uh, it's easier to understand how the navigation flows happen and how the uh, user interaction is proposed in this uh, particular application. And that's a great thing. And I was uh, initially intrigued by the thought of uh, having the symbols, but that was not the main reason what attracted to me. Uh, you did not just develop a, a symbolic language to show how things will flow but you made it into an executable model. Uh, that is what intrigued me, as we shall see later. But before we jump ahead of ourselves, uh, I would like you to explain a little bit of how the IFML uh, addresses these issues. And if you can just give some foundational um, instruction of how IFML uh, symbols uh, were designed. Uh, well, sure. Uh, yeah, we, we will. Uh go a little bit into the meat now. So wh what is the philosophy behind uh, our approach? Well, the general idea is basically represented here. What we want to do is to describe our software system through a model, through an abstract representation that lets us capture the essential aspects of the system that are relevant for solving our problem. The idea is you design through a model what is relevant for your problem and what represents the system with respect to your concern. This is the idea. And this is the basis, the foundation for uh, what we call model-driven engineering, that is uh, protocols and practices for using models to improve productivity and processes in software. We applied this philosophy to the specific problem of user interface design, user interaction design. What do we mean with user interaction design? We mean the fact that we want to describe what people do when they interact with the systems through abstraction in a way that we can ignore all the technical details, all the implementation details, all the platform specific aspects of the user interaction and we focus on the actual interaction of the person. What is the perceived uh, set of steps, ste steps, actions, events, whatever the user perceives as relevant when interacting with the system. Let's say what we keep out of the picture is the purely graphical aspects. What we usually say refer to with the when we talk about graphical styling uh, you know icons uh, colors uh, gra styles uh, of the user interface this is not really the focus of our discussion today and of our approach what we really are interested into is what the user does when he interacts with our system. And we describe it by defining models that, that, that represent this aspect of the system, and also we describe it by referencing other models, other perspectives, other viewpoints on our system. Mm, so to cover this, basically IFML relies to the uh, coverage of these points you see here. Basically, with IFML, you are able to describe what is shown in the user interface, so the content of the user interface, what are the interaction options you have in the user interface as a user, and what, which navigation paths you can follow in the user interface as a user. To do that, we capture user events or system events in the interaction and based on these events we let the user navigate across along these paths. Related to the last point I was mentioning before instead 
we also allow a user interface to bind with a business logic and the persistence and data storage, database uh, storage layer of our system so that we have a comprehensive view where the IFML part, the user interface, the user interaction is only one of the many perspectives of, our, of the design of our system and at the same time is not a standalone description of only the UI. It's something that perfectly binds and connects and collaborates with the other perspectives in the design of the system. Concretely, just to come down to practical, oops, sorry, to practical, uh, just to come down to practical uh, uh, description of IFML, IFML is really simple in essence. If you want to learn it in one shot, you, we can say that IFML is about the, a graphical notation, a graphical modeling approach to the user interface design that boils down to these four concepts initially. Obviously then it gets a little bit more complete and complex, but I think that if you, ca if you can get this idea of these four basic building blocks, you get most of it already. Um, what you see here are the four main elements that, that are used in IFML. The first one is the container element. The container represents an empty box uh, sh uh, representing, for instance, a web page or a screen in a mobile application or a window in a desktop application or a desktop operating system. It's something that is containing a, p a relevant piece of the user interaction. Inside that, inside this container, then you can start populating the content of the user interface by putting in what we call view components. View components are basically uh, these uh, gray boxes with uh, rounded uh, corners. These gray boxes represent the widgets, the, the visual elements you can put in the page or in the screen of your applications. And over these screens and over these components, you can apply, specify events. Events are represented by these symbols, symbol, <coughs> a simple circle, that describe the fact that over that element, you enable a user interaction or a, any kind, actually, any kind of user event to happen. Starting from these events, then you will be able to specify navigation flows. Navigation flows are exactly what I said before, possible paths that users can follow by combining one or more user interactions. Just to be uh, concrete and practical, let's go to a very simple example, probably the most trivial example of user interaction you can imagine. If you look at this example here, this is a, you may recognize a wireframe or a mock-up of a user interface that people frequently use for describing uh, in a quick way how a user interaction, a user interface or a, or a web page is shown. What you see here is something describing the entire structure of your user interface and some content. So this simple page is showing you some information about artists. So you have an index, a list of artists here and the idea, you can gasp uh, very quickly, is that when you click on an artist, you see on the right-hand side the detail on this artist. Now, this way of working is typical of uh, graphical designers that need to give a first idea to, the commit to, to, to their stakeholders about how the rendering of the user interface will end up. IFML takes a completely different approach and starting from the same objective, it describes the, the modeling in a different way with the symbols we were showing before. What you see here on the right hand side of the screen is a representation in IFML of the same user interaction. So what you see is that we still have the container exactly as in a wireframe that is uh, the IFML container now, artists, Inside it, what we do is we specify 
the content of this container through the components. So we have the list of artists and we have the, let's say, the detailed description of one artist in particular. What is missing on in the wireframe visualization is the dynamicity of the interaction, which is instead very well visible here. What we are doing is, here is, we are saying that in the artist list, we are enabling a, a one specific user interaction event, that is the fact of clicking on one element, and this arrow specifies that when this event, happen, this event specific event happens, uh, the user is driven through this path and he will be able to see the details of the artist he selected. So at the end we, we are exactly using the elements I mentioned before, the view container, the event and the view components and the user interaction in the middle to describe the din dynamicity of the interaction uh, of the interaction. This is, this is all about IFML in a very basic uh, sense. Uh, the subsequent step and the interesting point is that model-driven development is about describing a model as we did so far, but not only just that. Uh, it's actually about saying that starting from that model, you can transform automatically this model into something that is your software, that is up and running. So the model-driven development approach states that you combine modeling with model transformations in a way that you can get running software out of the model. So modeling is not meant to be, you know, an abstract or academic exercise that you deal with uh, for documentation purposes. Modeling is the essence of the, of the value you put in your application design. And modeling remains the main asset of your design. Out of the model, you will get, say, for free, the running applications. And this, the, the good thing is that given that the model is so abstract and platform independent, the source code you are able to generate, in principle, could cover any kind of technology and platforms you like. So the source code you get could actually be multiple because from the same model, you could be able to generate source code for your web interface, your web applications, as well as source code for your mobile apps or for your desktop, uh, uh, say, I don't know, administrations part of the applications. And this is one of the main advantages of the, of the thing. Out of one platform independent model, you can get for free, through automatic code generation, one or more uh, running software for multiple platforms. Thank you, Professor. That was a lot of information there and uh, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to learn the fundamentals of IFML from the inventor of IFML. Uh, that's a great privilege. Uh, what uh, I really want to emphasize here is that the two diagrams that you showed is one was the normal approach uh, in which uh, we have some clarity as to what is being uh, said uh, and the developer understands looking at that wireframe so this is what I need to develop but using the IFML approach we are not just having a pictorial representation there but uh, we are able to actually connect it to the actual models and then generate the real source code which can actually run and the users and the business heads can see the prototype of the running uh, real source code and that is uh, what the a very uh, uh, intriguing part of this uh, IFML specification is that it is an executable framework. So uh, talking about the source code, uh, I know that uh, you also are associated uh, with web ratio platform uh, that uh, generates uh, or puts this implementation into uh, a framework into a implementation and real practice. Could you enlighten us a little more on what are the languages that uh, are currently implemented using this framework and uh, how, uh, you know, 
if you can elaborate a little bit on that, what is currently available so users can, uh, our audience can actually go and try something. Well, sure. As I said before, this approach is not just an academic exercise, it's not just a theoretical approach. It actually combines a lot of, you know, background and theoretical studies with actual usage in industry. So together with the IFML specification, which is a standard, it's open, you can download it from oh, the OMG uh, uh, specification servers, you also get possibility of using the language through uh, actual model editors that are available uh, as, as commercial tools. Actually, there are a few spe a few implementations already. Even though IFML is one of the newest standards in OMG, it's, it has been less than one year since uh, it has been uh, standardized. Uh, we already have a few implementations. First of all, we have, there is a, an open source editor of IFML that is available on GitHub, and anyone can download and use for free and uh, modify uh, at, its, uh, pleasure, at its pleasure. This editor is uh, some sort of reference implementation of IFML, although it comes with just editing capabilities. Other tools, like for instance the web ratio platform, uh, provide instead full-fledged IFML modeling together with a plenty of other, other features that are typically required for industrial implementation. So for instance, this uh, I, uh, web ratio tool provides obviously the IFML editors, but also code generators uh, that generate quick prototypes and down to the final uh, systems to be deployed, together with plenty of, fa uh, of uh, facilities like documentation, project documentation generation, teamwork support, debugging, and the model checking capabilities for determining uh, model errors, language errors while modeling, as well as identifying uh, errors in the, in the design and so on together with plenty of learning resources, and maybe we can come back to this later. And the good thing is WebRatio already uh, exploits this uh, multi-platform uh, support of IFML by providing code generation both for web applications, so out of IFML models similar to the ones you see in these uh, screens, you can get your up and, up and running your websites, but also from IFML models, you can get mobile apps available with a one-click code generation out of the models. Uh, and that, I mean, that's not all, in the sense that um, uh, in the OMG consortium, we are also uh, in charge uh, uh, of uh, disseminating IFML, and we are in touch with the other vendors that uh, are interested in this specification and are uh, looking into the possibility of implementing uh, IFML within their tools that already exist. For instance, inside UML tools, uh, or, um, and they are trying to understand how uh, this can be combined together in their tooling infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, I think um, as I will take this opportunity to remind our audience that uh, this is a three-part webinar series, and in part two, uh, Stefano, one of the founders of WebRatio and the CEO, is uh, going to join us to explain the WebRatio platform uh, and uh, the practical implementations in which corporations they, they have implemented and what challenges they face. So people uh, who are interested in knowing uh, more about how this uh, technology is actually put into practice, they may join us uh, two Wednesdays from now at the same time in a webinar session number two. And in session three uh, on December two, uh, we will be demonstrating live a complete end-to-end -end mobile application using the comprehensive uh, implementation of IFML, UML, BPM in the web ratio platform. So, Professor, to keep to the uh, point of our today's session, uh, 
could you explain to us uh, what are the major uh, advantages? I know that uh, we can generate source code and uh, uh, a number of vendors, I presume, are already building engines to read these models and create source code in different languages. Uh, at a high level, uh, what are the specific advantages of this approach uh, and uh, uh, what you have seen in, in practice uh, uh, people gaining out of this? If you can highlight some of those things, that would be really uh, helpful for the audience. Yes, sure. Well, uh, just to summarize some of the advantages I mentioned already, I think that, well, the first theoretical value of IFML is that when using IFML, you get a formal specification of the entire user interface and user interaction perspective uh, with respect to your uh, system design. So uh, you have a form, an official standard. You can claim that what you are specifying is not just uh, given in a dialect you build up, built up in a day for your own purposes, but this is meant to be general and generally understandable. Uh, you have the formal specification of the language, you have the formal specification of your models, you have a way for formalizing only the part that is relevant for your problem, and specifically only the part that is about the user interaction. So uh, it's no time, uh, there's no time anymore for starting thinking about general purpose languages that should cover any aspect of the modeling or the design of the system. What you're talking about here is a very extremely effective targeted and focused language for the specific, for covering the specific needs of the user interaction design. While on the other side, keeping uh, apart the rest of the aspects. So you focus on the UI, you, in a sense, you forget about the rest of the system design and so you separate the concerns while at the same time you keep uh, some hooks to the rest of the design perspectives by adding into the UI modeling some binding to the rest of the, of the system design. So connection to the data, connection to the business logic. One of the main uh, advantages you get out of this is that what your modeling, your design, is something that really increases the, the possibility of, uh, of communication and uh, seamless understanding between different stakeholders because the models you show could be understood by the business people, by the IT people, by the graphical design people at the same time. So you somehow reduce the risk of misunderstandings and misalignment. And finally, last but not least, as we said before, you get automatic code generation out of the pitch, out, for free, out of this uh, big picture. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor. That was a great uh, insight. Uh, we want to actually, uh, I'm sure uh, most of the audience like me are more um, uh, inclined to get a little more deeper insight into the specification, but uh, just uh, in the Mean uh, time. I want to remind if somebody wants to do a QA uh, and for the QA session, if you have any questions that you may post in the chat window. Yeah. So um, uh, I will steal a few minutes of your time and show you some additional examples of IFML, just to let you grab the the perspective, the, the entire perspective, the entire picture about what you can cover with IFML and how you can get to the points and to the advantages I was mentioning. For instance, when I was mentioning the fact that you are actually describing the user interaction, but you can bind to the business logic, what I really meant is that really uh, you can design things like the one you see here uh, describing the user navigation, the user behavior, as well as the impact this has on the system, on the data. For instance, here you see a screen, a container, 
containing one widget, that is, for instance, a list of albums, a list of music albums, for instance, and suppose here we are into a content management system and you want to also allow people to create or delete or modify content, here we are adding a, 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 a user event on the album list, that it's again probably a click event on an album, and what we want to achieve is that when you click on an album, you actually delete this album from the database. That's pretty simple to design, as you see, basically the navigation flow, the, the, the navigation path, is not leading the user directly to another screen, but in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile while navigating to the next screen, the, the navigation stops into this uh, hexagon symbol that is what we call actions. This is an invocation of a business or logic action on the data that performs some specific behavior, right? So by clicking on the, on the specific album, I'm actually triggering the deletion of the album from the database. And when the deletion is finished, then the user is redirected back to the album list, which obviously at this point will show only the albums remaining. So excluding the one I, I just deleted. So this is just a pretty trivial example of business logic invocation, but uh, that, that relates to the data. But you can imagine very similar behaviors could be modeled for many other uh, scenarios. For instance, the typical case of e-commerce website, right, where you are supposing a page with your shopping cart and you want to perform a checkout, well, Actually, the checkout will consist of a process where in one or more steps you end up paying your order. So typically, this is just obviously a toy example, but typically you have your to enter your customer information, then your payment credit card information, and then you actually execute the payment. So here you are triggering the business logic of the payment, and then you get some kind of confirmation message. This is the typical navigation path for a checkout in a simplified way. Uh, if you design it entirely with IFML, well, things get just a little bit more complex, but at the same time also extremely more self-explaining and complete. So by simply adding what is shown in every step of the navigation, you are describing a lot more of the, of the interaction. So for instance, here you are saying that, well, the shopping cart is actually a list showing the list of products that you have added to your shopping cart. Then here, you will probably click on a button named Checkout. <coughs> when you do that, well, you are redirected to the steps of the process where I, I show you a form where you enter your customer information, you submit the information, and then you go to the next step where you enter your payment information, credit card number, and so on and then you enter also, also that, and at this point, with all this information together, I, the payment execution is invoked. In this specific case, this payment execution could be, you know, a web service call to a banking system or whatever uh, remote uh, uh, API invocation. And finally, you end up with seeing some kind of confirmation, and that's the, the message, the final message. So now, next step in IFML is that, yes, you can model all of this. You can model in this way entire websites, entire mobile applications. The interesting point is that what you can do here is not only model everything you need, but also trying to make the modeling as productive, as reusable as possible. For instance, here we have a very clear description of the user interaction for the checkout process. Well, what IFML lets you do, allows you to do is that you can define your own definition of the checkout process by defining an entire module, module represented here by this big gray box. This module is describing the fact that the entire process is somehow wrapped into a black box now, 
And this black box is simply something where you provide the amount to pay. You have a black box here. You don't really care about it anymore. And finally, you end up with a confirmation message to be shown to the user. Once you do that, so you modularize your design, you can very easily and very conveniently reuse this design all over the place in any of your uh, models you, you are going to design in the future. At the same time, this also makes the design much more readable and much simpler. So with the specification like this, your checkout process gets to this level of simplicity. You have a shopping cart, your product list. When you check out, well, yes, you have all that process we were discussing before, but really all of this is hidden inside this black box payment execution. And the payment execution is definition is provided separately. So at any point in your user interaction, you want to perform payment executions, you simply reuse this module that you have specified here. And this grants reusability, high coherency of the user interface, and single, one single point where to go and apply changes in the future for every payment execution we need in the future. Uh, furthermore, just to give you a, a general understanding of what I meant with the integration with other modeling perspectives, just think about, think about, for instance, a perspective where you want to model not specifically the user interface, but you want to model the business uh, of, of a company, like in this case, you'll probably end up using different design uh, approaches. So for instance, the, in this example, we are using BPMN. I don't know if all of you are familiar with that, but BPMN is a very well known uh, standard for describing business process models. Um, this, again, toy example is a simple case where we describe how a customer interacts with a rental, car rental, for uh, booking a car, no? Right? So here the renter books, uh, goes and tries to book a car, he gets confirmation of his car uh, available, he performs the payment for the booking, then when the day comes for picking up the car, he goes, I mean, he walks in into the car rental and picks up the car, and that's it. So now the, the interesting thing is, this is a completely different perspective, because here we are not talking about user interfaces. We're not even talking about any information system at all, right? This is just talking about business, how the business model of a rental car booking system should work. Even though you think about your business at this level of abstraction, the nice thing is you can always bind it back to the other levels of modeling so that the business requirements could be at this level, but then you can bind it to the other aspects of the design, including the user interaction. So for instance, uh, the payment execution, since we were talking about it le uh, just minutes ago, the payment execution, ha, huh, just by chance, is something that maps into a predefined module that you specified with IFML describing the payment execution interaction flow that you expect for your customers for covering this specific need. So one specific activity at a business level maps into say one or more steps of user interaction in the IFML uh, level of the UI modeling part of the system. So this is the big, the big uh, uh, advent set of advantages. I would say it's uh, you get from using a modeling, a multi-perspective modeling approach, and using a language like IFML. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that explanation. Uh, that was uh, very valuable. So we built a, a model uh, or a module uh, explaining a certain flows, and then we can plug it in any other um, uh, 
flows that we want, but not only that, it is also integrated with another uh, specification like a BMN uh, BP, uh, M, uh, M specification and uh, they work, uh, interact with each other flawlessly because all these are uh, universally acceptable uh, specification approved by the OMG and that is what brings uh, the big advantage of this uh, approach of uh, designing through visual modeling. Uh, so uh, we, we saw a number of advantages and uh, we can list them again uh, later. Uh, what uh, I want, uh, uh, I think the audience would also like to hear is in your experience interacting with uh, uh, the real organizations apart from the academics, uh, there must have been some challenges because when I first started looking at this, it seems uh, pretty uh, a le a steep learning curve and uh, understanding how this whole thing works. So what is your personal uh, experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, organizations who committed to this approach and who are uh, you know, already implemented as you interact with them. What do you hear uh, them say and what is it that uh, uh, comes uh, as a most uh, important uh, challenge that uh, people face when they try to make this paradigm shift in their development approach? Yes, okay, thank you for bringing this up. Well, first, of, first, of, first thing first, uh, I would like to say that, as I said, IFML has been actually already put at work in large organizations, in large projects uh, all over the world. So these are just a few examples of customers that adopted IFML and uh, mm, all over the world. Some of, mm, of them are from Italy and from Europe, uh, but you may recognize their brands, like uh, there's plenty of company in the uh, uh, utility sector that uh, relate to energy, uh, water consumption, uh, petrol uh, market and so on. There are plenty of services company related to city, public bodies, uh, public transportation. There are actually also plenty of finance company, so banks uh, and bank associations all over e Europe that adopted it. Uh, there are plenty of production companies also, plenty of uh, distribution and retailers, and let's say big brands, for instance, in the uh, high-end fashion uh, field like Prada and Loro Priana, or um, many other uh, brands you may recognize here, uh, General Electric, among others, others we can mention, but that they all, well, Acer, for instance, again, uh, they all realized that an approach like this could provide the huge benefits in, in terms of productivity, especially on large projects. So, uh, just as an example, <clears throat> I picked three or four cases here from different sectors. So, for instance, the first one, Unicredit, is a large bank in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they decided to build their entire leasing management system on IFML. So they built a combined modeling approach combining the business process level and the user interaction modeling based on IFML for designing the entire infrastructure. And their set of processes covered hundreds of different roles and players that interacted in this kind of interactions. Or for instance, in General Electric's G Capital, we built an entire then, uh, fleet management system for all their assets they were giving out uh, through leasing uh, contracts. Uh, and all of this was also built with IFML, deployed on multiple countries with hundreds of thousands of users and hundreds of thousands of assets managed with, the, with this system, which was extremely large in terms of size and challenges. Other example, Acer. Acer uh, built, has built all its entire web presence worldwide with, based on IFML. Not just IFML, but IFML, I mean uh, all of them, they are not just using IFML as a specification language, they use IFML and they all use 
complete code generation for all their products and they cover tens of countries, languages, uh, hundreds of thousands of users. Final example, for instance, instead is a, a furniture provider. They produce, I mean, it's one of, the, it's probably the biggest worldwide furniture provider uh, in the, in the, let's say, uh, uh, consumer market. Uh, they built an entire infrastructure for question answering, trouble ticketing, uh, internet management with IFML, and also their entire system for cash flow organization and management and end of the day closure of the cash uh, flow, all with IFML, integrating the cashiers, integrating the store level uh, cash flow and integrating them at the country and regional level. All of these for 44 com 42 countries and hundreds, actually thousands of uh, stores all over the world. So, I mean, this, this span and the extension of IFML-based models is uh, definitely uh, extremely large. What I would say, the main advantages you get when your projects are actually large, because productivity increases even more, thanks to this uh, regularity in the design, repetition, and reuse. Obviously, you also have some challenges that are, for instance, you expect your designers to, to change a little bit their mindset. You are not talking to developers that need to write uh, hundreds of lines of code anymore. The code will come out for free out of the code generators. Your people will be in charge to the high-level design. So their work, their job, will be actually much more valuable and they will produce much more valuable assets because their results will be high-level models and not low-end uh, code. While at the same time, <laughs> your design you are building is, by, is natively ready for maintenance and evolution. Actually, what I would say is that uh, my, most or even higher advantage of using uh, modeling approaches comes from the advantages you get for the evolutionary part. So we know that the initial deployment of an app application is just uh, let's say a fraction of its cost. If the application needs to stay alive for years, you will need to put into account, to keep into account a large amount of costs for maintenance and evolution. Well, modeling dramatically cuts the cost for the maintenance and evolution as well. Actually, in an even more dramatic way than the uh, initial mm, application generation. On the other side, as I said, from the quality of the result, you get a much more coherent uh, design, much more coherent user experience, and you can even achieve uh, cross-device coherent user experience with a so-called liquid experience, in the sense that you can design uh, with the same modeling approach user experience across different devices, because you can design it for your mobile phone, and then you can design this the continuation of the experience on a website and so on. Uh, so these are more or less, I would say, what I would consider the most relevant dimensions and challenges you need to face. Large projects, large size, the larger the better, the, the more maintenance and evolution you expect for your system, the better improvement of productivity will get in the future. Thank you, Professor. That was a great insight. Uh, I think we have uh, about six minutes left, and I'm sure there are some questions. So just to summarize uh, what we studied today from Professor Marco was that um, IFML in conjunction uh, with UML, BPM, and all these visual modeling specifications approved by the OMG the, provides uh, excellent uh, 
alternative to the current development approach and the benefits as we can see are huge in terms of uh, just having consistency across all the platforms and uh, we are having a code uh, generated uh, out of the visual model so if uh, uh, there are engines available of different languages that can read this uh, uh, specification uh, uh, ONG approved uh, specification uh, modeled code and um, generate in different uh, say Java or C sharp or whatever uh, technology stack the organization uh, has accepted uh, it it would uh, definitely mean a great deal of savings in terms of development as well as uh, time to market uh, will be much quicker and also from the evolution perspective maintenance perspective we are as as much as the engines can be engineered to de to generate uh, the code which follows the best practices in terms of security and optimization performance so really it shifts a lot of uh, the skills inside the code generation engine and the developers are uh, now able to just apply their uh, logical and thinking ski, uh, skills into creating these models. So I really see a lot of potential in this approach and I'm sure uh, most of our audience uh, would like to more, know more about this. Uh, Professor Marco has also written uh, books on this and uh, it, it's, it's a publicly available uh, specification on the ifml.org website. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we are running uh, in the last few minutes. If there are some questions, uh, uh, we might want to jump to the questions and uh, also to remind uh, folks that we have recorded this webinar uh, we also have the slides uh, we will shortly email all those who have registered so they will be able to have um, a copy of the uh, slides that we shared as well as uh, they can view at leisure if they are not able to attend today so let's move to the QA session uh, Michaela yes thank you Daniel and Marco for this presentation uh, we have received a number of questions and now I would like Marco to answer some of them uh, just a quick note, even if uh, we run off, out of time, Marco will answer all remaining questions in the follow-up email we are going to send to all participants. So Marco, first question is, how is it possible to incorporate uh, custom web services uh, in the AFML model? Uh, well, this is pretty simple actually. Um, supposing by web service you mean uh, backend backend services like APIs and so on, they are easy to integrate in the sense that these are the typical, they represent the typical case of integration of custom business logic with the user interaction. So for instance, this is the example I was showing uh, regarding the uh, payment process. The payment step could, could easily be a custom web service provided by some bank organization uh, that you can invoke in that simple way. So you specify that you are going, as a business logic binding, you are going to invoke a, a REST service or a SOAP web service or a backend API of your own internal web servers uh, on your own web servers and that's it. So the modeling takes care of the invocation provided that you you have uh, you are providing the right input and output parameters to your web service invocations. If instead by web service you mean pieces of web applications including also the user interface, some parts of the UI model could be modeled as black boxes including also UI widgets that you provide uh, say as uh, pieces of the interface that are, say, not completely uh, transparent to the modeling approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have another question. Uh, basically, the, the idea is to understand wh which, which, uh, which sort of projects is IFML best suited for. Uh, what if we have a uh, very large ap application that should be scalable. Uh, how we can handle this in the design uh, using IFML and how practical would be uh, designing these applications with IFML and web ratio? Uh, this is, uh, the, the response of this is actually 
as Mikhail was already anticipating is probably combining the advantages of the language and all of the tool. <coughs> so regarding to practicality of dealing with large models, I must say that IFML is not going to become, IFML designs are not going to become one single diagram of huge size all together in one clumsy uh, representation. Typically what you do is you work by modularization. So as I was showing you in the case of the payment execution, you work by modularizing the design. So you build up pieces of the models separately according to uh, coher internal coherency and separation of concerns and you split the design into different views that then are integrated all together. At the same time, also, the tool provides uh, facilities, for instance, for uh, shrinking or opening up pieces of the models in an interactive way so that you never deal with, uh, let's say, unmanageable sizes of the diagrams, but you always you, are, you always have the possibility of uh, zooming in and detailing and searching and uh, 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 working on the specific focus you are looking at at a specific moment. So I, um, that the, I, I understand that this I needs to be probably experienced in practice and probably we will also we will also have some hints on this in the next webinars. But this is, let's say, at least uh, in, at the theoretical level, the way uh, this problem is dealt with. Yeah, thank you, Professor. I think we're at the top of the hour. And the fact that uh, this has been implemented uh, worldwide in large corporations, I'm sure these issues have been uh, addressed. And uh, uh, we would like to definitely answer questions. Uh, uh, folks, please feel free to write to Professor Marco or uh, myself, Daniel Parde, and we would be more than glad to answer any uh, specific questions which would not be answered today. And we apologize for going two minutes above the hour. We really thank you for your time. Uh, taking your time to join us this morning. And we really look forward to uh, uh, see you back on the webinar two, where uh, the founder, Stefano of WebRatio, is going to talk about the actual real uh, life implementations uh, of uh, this platform. Uh, and uh, following that, we also have the live demo in webinar three. Thank you once again, and look forward to seeing you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.